Hi, YouTubers. This is Lonnie Clark again. That's for art. Here's my protest line that I had today at the uh, one woman uh, Earth Day protest. Evidently, people in America don't believe we need to protest anymore. They think it's just, what's the point? They're going to take over and beat us over the head anyway. So they feel like all they're doing is exposing themselves. I stood out for about, I don't know, almost two hours in front of the federal building. Louisa Hamachek called. We kind of got into words because she wanted to come and join me afterwards, but I was going to be gone. But she said, well, I'm going to represent the children. And I said, that's bullshit. This is not Happy Earth Day. This is like, let's protect the earth from the fucking corporations that are killing us. This is about this. Your child is being harmed. That's what it is. Our children are being harmed. This is about us stopping them from destroying all of humanity and most life on this planet. So in that vein, I'm going to get going. I'm going to read this book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Arthur Tamplin, John Goffman. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be out at Oregon State University. Rick from Eugene Peaceworks called and said they're having like a little community gathering where the nuclear scientists are going to try to talk us into how great nuclear is. Catherine Hagel is going to be there. I can't wait to confront her. I'm going to bring this book and some information. I'm going to do my homework tonight so that when I get there I can confront her and talk about John Goffman and the work that they've done and how the nuclear industry has done nothing but lie to all of us for a long time based on false thesis that they run on as if it's truth. The supreme denial of uh, catastrophic cancer. Anyways, I'm going to get to reading. As you can tell, I'm full. Let's just put it to you that way. I'm full of it. I'm up to here with the lies and the bullshit. Let me get to reading. So uh, we are on page 194 in Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution, Arthur Tamplin, John Goffman. And uh, we are on the chapter 10, I think it is, the Nuclear Weapons Program. New subtitle. The think tanks fight nuclear wars on paper. In the early 1960s, Mr. Kahn and others were discussing nuclear wars in which some 1,500 megatons were dropped on the United States. At that time, the outcome of these wars resulted in the death of some 90% of the population of the United States. In the latest reports from the RAND Corporation, Stanford Research Institute, Institute for Defense Analysis, and other think tanks the wars which were being gained today considered up to 12,000 megatons being delivered. Strangely enough, although the number of the megatons, megatons that are war gamed have increased some tenfold, in some of the, these games, more than 50% of the population survives a nuclear attack. Thus, in the absence of the public debate concerning the effects of nuclear war, the nuclear weapons have become more sophisticated the number of megatons that would be delivered upon the United States has increased something approaching tenfold, and yet the people who count the dead would suggest today that more people would survive the vastly greater war. One of the reasons why these paper studies conducted by the think tanks for the DOD AEC complex would suggest that the nuclear weapons are less effective today than they were in 1960 is that the war games that they were playing now have different rules. One change in these rules suggests in, in, suge, results in individuals surviving in fallout shelters. Another major change has been that in order to make, nu, make, make nuclear war thinkable, the military strategists have decided that the other nation, the one which will attack the United States, will deliver its first salvo of missiles against our strategic deterrent. As a consequence, the targeting of devices concentrates them in different parts of the country more than the weapons which were involved in the wars being programmed or played in the early 1960s. So he's talking about here them fucking talking about war in the abstract and just making up fucking numbers and hypotheses. It's fucking unbelievable. However, if we seriously examine these paper studies, we discover something which could come to no surprise to anyone. The situation is still the same as it was in the early 1960s. 
With or without these paper wars, most of the population in the United States would be killed as a result of the nuclear war. And quite possibly in the aftermath, the living would envy the dead. It should be remembered that 50% survival figures are nothing new. During the defense, the civil defense debate, Herman Kahn and others also indicated that if we spent this or that number of billions of dollars, we could save 50% or more of our population. Nevertheless, recognizing that hundreds of millions of human beings would be killed or maimed, that one of the legacies of the nuclear war would be genetic change, which would produce severe consequences for more than a thousand years and that a society emerging from its fallout shelters into such a ravaged landscape could not be the same society that entered the shelters. The American public summarily rejected civil defense. Wow. New subtitle. Then try to make war feasible and safe. I think that's where we're at now, folks. I think they think that these wars in the Middle East are safe for America. What seems incredible is that the paper studies of these closed circuit groups who have been studying and developing the emerging new nuclear strategy of this country indicate that for some time they have been convinced that nuclear war is a feasible human endeavor. As an example of the extent to which they have gone in order to plan and count the dead and living, we can cite one report which deals with the individuals who have gone for shelter in a two-story building. This building has a basement and two floors above the basement. Now the fallout from the nuclear war will fall on the roof and the ground surrounding the building. The nature of the physics in this situation is that the basement offers the greatest reduction in dosage to the individual and that as one moves up to the first floor, there is still, that is still preferred to the second floor. Therefore, in order to keep these people alive, the planners devised the ingenious plan of moving people who are in the basement stepwise to the second floor where they can stay for a long period of time, and then subsequently rotating them, rotating them back to the basement. <laughs> In this way, the planners were able to average the dosage to the individuals in the buildings to the point where they figured that all the individuals would survive. Hmm. Quite simple, isn't it? Hmm. Another example of the extreme to which this such a closed-circuit group has contemplated the post-war situation, let us consider a few quotations from a report prepared by the Rand Corporation. Quote, Furthermore, it would be impossible to limit preferential treatment to labor force members alone, for the working members of society would insist on transferring some part of their personal advantages to members of their families who were not directly contributing to output. Policymakers would presumably have to draw the line somewhere, however, in making such concessions, and that most likely to suffer are people who, with little or no productive potential, old people, chronic invalids, and the insane. Old people spe suffer the special disadvantage of being easily identified as a group and therefore subject to categorical treatment. In this sense, at least, a community under stress would be better off without its old and feeble members. Motherfucker, can you believe these fucking people wrote this? I continue. The easiest way to implement a morally repugnant but socially beneficial policy is by inaction. Under stress, the managers of post-attack society would most likely resolve their problem by failing to make any provision at all for the special needs of the elderly, the insane, and the chronically ill. Hey, we are there right now already today. We have millions of people, hundreds of thousands of elderly, insane, and chronically ill who cannot get care in this country. There have been made absolutely no provisions for them. I know someone right now who is disabled who went to the hospital and they told her to get the fuck out. Instead of Medicare for persons over 65, for example, we might have Medicare for persons under 15. Instead of pensions, we might have family allowances. To be sure, the government would not be able, nor would likely, 
nor would it likely to try to prevent the relatives and friends of old people from helping them. But overall, the share of the elderly in the national product would certainly drop." Unquote. These quotations would suggest that if you are going to think about nuclear wars, you have to be as cold-blooded as a snake. Let's repeat that. These quotations would suggest that if you were going to think about nuclear wars, you have to be as cold-blooded as a snake. This is why most Americans refuse to consider nuclear war as a feasible human activity. Nevertheless, since the early 1960s, the Department of Defense and the Atomic Energy Commission have sponsored studies that considered in meticulous detail the effects of nuclear war and post-war recovery era. The nature of these studies can be at best described as a valiant attempt to make nuclear war a feasible human endeavor. The tragic thing about these studies is that they undoubtedly form part of the thought processes of many members of the Pentagon who are involved in developing our present-day nuclear strategy. <coughs> On the other hand, a number of individuals within the Pentagon and the Atomic Energy Commission have made decisions concerning the development of various nuclear weapon systems without any real consideration of biological effects of nuclear war. It would seem that they left decisions concerning the real need for these systems to other individuals. As an example of this, we would simply offer the directors of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory at Livermore. This laboratory is the major weapons laboratory of the nation. As a matter of a fact, there is only one other weapons development laboratory, and that is Los Alamos Laboratory. But Livermore carries a lion's share of the weapons development effort. That's the business of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory at Livermore, the development and testing of nuclear weapons. New subtitle, Nuclear War Planning Ignores Biological Effect. But strange, strangely enough, in December of 1968, Tamplin was asked to brief the directors of the laboratory on the effects of nuclear war. At this time, Excuse me. At this particular time, the directors of the laboratory had come out strongly in support of the new military system, multi-reentry vehicle, MIRV, and anti-ballistic missiles, ABM. As a consequence of the discussion subsequent to that briefing, it became apparent that while the directors of the Livermore Laboratory were strongly supporting the development of these new weapon systems, they had very little concept of the devastating nature of their own or the Russians' existing nuclear capability. Moreover, Dr. Michael May, in setting the guidelines for the briefing, indicated that he was only concerned with the immediate survival of the people. He was not concerned with the long-term biological effects or the genetic consequences of radiation. It is a real tragedy of the modern day, excuse me, it is a real tragedy, it is a real tragedy of modern day that the directors of Livermore Laboratory and their extremely parochial attitudes should have so much influence on the policies of this nation that relate to all mankind for all time. Contrast the directors of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory with Dr. Freeman Dyson, a physicist from the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies. In the, in the April 1969 issue of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, Professor E.J. Sternglass of the University of Pittsburgh published a report, already discussed, in which he suggests that the fallout from nuclear weapons tests was responsible for 400,000 infant deaths in the United States. In that same issue of the Bulletin, Dr. Dyson had published an article that represented a very strong support for the proposed ABM system. In the June issue of the Bulletin, Dr. Dyson submitted a small communication in which he indicated that his arguments favorable to the ABM system were insignificant in light of the article of Sternglass. He indicated that Stern, the Sternglass article was a substantial argument against the ABM system. Confronted with the potential biological effects of radiation, this 
phys physicist modified his stand on the ABM system. New subtitle and last subtitle of this chapter. So I'm going to pursue it. Spending billions to protect missiles rather than people. <clears throat> Thus, although there has since the early 1960s been an absence of public debate concerning the effects of nuclear war, the Department of Defense and the AEC have been proceeding since that time with the concept that nuclear war is a feasible human activity. The development of the ABM concept, the MIRV, and the whole present nuclear strategy of the military that has occurred since that time, aided and embedded by the macabre studies conducted by members of this closed circuit community. I'm sorry, I'm going to read that sentence again because I didn't understand it. I don't know how you guys can. <clears throat> okay, let's try it again. The development of the ABM, con ABM concept, the MIRV, and the whole present nuclear strategy of the military has a, that has occurred since that time, aided and embedded by macabre studies conducted by members of this closed circuit industry. We're just going to ignore my phone ringing. That's my cell phone. So it'll go on for a minute. Um... The fate of all mankind is being decided by a fairly small group of individuals who have performed their paper studies in the complete absence of public scrutiny. Here we go. That's a huge sentence. The fate of all mankind is being decided by a fairly small group of individuals who have performed their paper studies in the complete absence of public scrutiny. Consider the absurd situation in which we now find ourselves. Boy, could we say that today. The Pentagon was not allowed. Oh, my gosh. Goodness. Hold on. I want to finish this. I'm going to ignore this. There you go. The Pentagon was not allowed to plan to fight a nuclear war through a multi-billion dollar program. Okay. Let me read that again. Consider the absurd situation in which we now find ourselves. The Pentagon was not allowed to plan to fight a nuclear war through a multi-billion dollar program aimed at protecting the population with a massive civilian defense effort. But the members of the Pentagon proved to be quite resourceful, and today we find them engaged in a multi-billion dollar program to protect a bunch of missiles. <laughs> Yeah, they couldn't protect the people, but they could protect the missiles. Many members of the Congress and the public must have been amazed when the AEC and the Department of Defense proposed the anti-ballistic missile program. It must have come as quite a shock because these members of the public and the Congress suddenly realized that the Pentagon and the AEC had been proceeding since the very early 1960s with the concept of the thinkability of a nuclear war. By proposing the ABM system, they have put the fat back into the fire. Many senators, realizing what was taking place, was de what made a determined effort to defeat the ABM proposal. Unfortunately, they lost by one vote. Hmm. <sighs> we were that close to ending the arms race. Just one more senator. We could now be embarked we could now be embarked on one of the noblest social experiments of all time, an experiment designed to end the terrible threat of a nuclear holocaust and bring about world peace. Let us hope that before too many more elections pass, this nation will have been able to elect that one more senator. Herein, herein must lie the greatness of America a nation willing to take the risk necessary for peace on earth. Wow, you guys. That's the end of chapter 10, and that is a stunning last statement. That is a time that is gone. We don't have that one more senator. And in fact, the maybe the one, it's kind of ironic, that one senator, right? Because we've got Hillary Monsanto, Westinghouse, Clinton running for president. And who else? Rand Paul. I guess he's a senator. Both lunatics, neither one of them have any interest at all in stopping the nuclear industry. It is just shocking. I'm going to end here. 
We're on chapter 12 or 11, Moral and Social Responsibility of Science and Scientists. Who we, and then how many more chapters do we have? Uh, I think, is that the very end of it? I think that's the last chapter, folks. Oh, no, we have two more chapters. The Urgent Need for Scientific Adversaries. So that's going to be chapter 12, and that'll be the end of it. So thank you, everybody, for uh, listening to me and Let's hope we put some of this information to use and we start remembering it. I'm going to go through some of the old videos and pull out some of the information to talk to Catherine Higley about tomorrow. So I think the best thing that we can do is try to help them see the error of their ways and help them understand that it's not over. It's, it's, we, need, we need them to break ranks. And this is why. Stop nuclear, stop cancer. Ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Put your thinking caps on. And let's get active. Let's, I mean, seriously active. If everybody that listened to this video, I know it's only like 25, 30 people. If those few people, every one of us, got engaged, went out into the streets, contacted our congressmen, our local senators, just did as much as we possibly could, we can make a dent. So hopefully this will motivate some folks. Ciao, you guys. Bye.